for this lesson. This is going to be a lot like the lesson from last week. You're going to hear things about a parable that we're going to look at tonight that you have probably never heard of before, for some of you. Some of you may have. Okay. So what I want to do is we are going to talk about the parable of the sower in Matthew. Okay. But in order to understand the parable of the sower in Matthew, we really have to take a look at the parable of the sower in Luke and in Mark as well. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time there. We will later, but for now, uh, we want to take a look at it just Matthew. However, before we start with the parable in Matthew, I need you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because in the parable in Matthew, as well as in Luke and as well as in Mark, you're going to see different types of believers, okay? So I need, we were going to cover this a few weeks ago, but the Lord had pushed it off to today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read verse 14 through 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. So that's 1 Corinthians 2.14 through 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. All right, here we go. But I have now, Lighthouse Rules are in Uh, chapter 2, verse 14. Alright, so in this passage we are going to see three different types of people. Okay, here we go. Verse 14, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. That's key. Because they are spiritually appraised. Verse 15, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he should instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, chapter 3, verse 1, watch. And I, brethren, brethren, so he's talking to believers, got it? Okay. Could not speak to you, believer, as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, now watch, as to babes in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, and you are, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like your men? All right, so this is what I want you to see. Very first thing. In verse 14 of chapter 2, we see an unsaved person. Anybody want to take a guess why verse 14 is talking about an unsaved person? What kind of a description does it give you? Natural. It's a natural man. But here's the key. He cannot understand spiritual things. No unsaved person can understand spiritual things. Okay? All right? Now, number 2 is in verses 15 through 16... The spiritual or the mature believer. The spiritual or the mature Christian. We see that he's spiritual. He appraises all things. That connects to that Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14, which talks about being able to discern good and bad. Okay? But then we have one more type of Christian. I said Christian because, yes, it's Christian. So this last Christian is a carnal Christian. This is a fleshly Christian. Now, it is important to understand that there is a difference between a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian. Let me give you that. Yes? I just want to uh, point out that the terms here, spiritual, is a lot different than what you hear in the church a lot nowadays. True. It's talking about having the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Of dis and discernment. And discernment. Yes. Not being spiritual like. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me ask you a question. Remember last week's study, right? What kind of fruit would a carnal Christian produce? What kind of fruit would a spiritual Christian produce? Okay. So, now, what we're going to do... Say that again? No fruit, because they're dead. That's so awesome. Okay, so now, here we go. Let's look at the parables of the sower. 
Like I said, it's mentioned in Luke chapter 8 and Mark chapter 4. However, each parable has a specific message in its teaching. Okay? You will see marked differences in each of the three parables. Okay? Understand, the Holy Spirit has the Word of God written in such a way that there are little things that are off. And he doesn't just expect you to say, ah, oh, the writer made a mistake. The writer didn't make a mistake because then you're saying the Holy Spirit made a mistake and that can't happen. Okay? Now, the Holy Spirit has done this to give us a complete threefold, threefold picture of salvation. Okay? Now remember, what have we talked about? Saved in the Spirit, that's a done deal. Can't change. Perfect tense in Greek, fit, completed work, carries on forever. Okay? Then there's the salvation of your soul. That is an ongoing process. And then we are looking forward to the kingdom of heaven. All right? So now, each of the three parables are all about bearing fruit. And they're all about Christians, except for one verse in Luke. But we're not necessarily going to look at that. All right? So let's look at this one. Luke. The emphasis in Luke is the fruit-bearing Christian with the salvation of the Spirit. Now hang on to these. I'm going to give you these, and we're actually going to take a look at the different seeds that it's mentioned. And you're going to see a marked difference in each of the three. Okay? You're going to notice something to be a little bit different about it. Okay? In Mark, this is a fruit-bearing Christian with an emphasis on the salvation of the soul. And then finally, Matthew, which is the one that we're really going to study tonight, because Matthew is really about the meat of the word. And that's why we even titled this, From Milk to Meat. How about that? Okay, so Matthew, the emphasis is a fruit-bearing Christian with an emphasis on submission to the word of the kingdom. Now, when I say the word of the kingdom, I'm talking about how you gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So that's, that's what the parable of Matthew is all about. It's about how to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. As a matter of fact, when you look at all of the parables in Matthew, they are pointing towards that one thing. Okay? All right, let's do this. Um, let's look at a couple of differences. All right, so we talked about salvation of the Spirit in Luke. So... The message in Luke is about salvation, meaning how to be, come from unsaved to saved. Okay? But then, after you get saved, what do you do with that? Okay? So that's the focus in Luke, is the message of salvation. First ten salvation, and there's salvation of the Spirit. Difference number two, in Mark, we see the message of a Christ-controlled life. Now, this is what we need to understand here. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm saved. I have a Christ-controlled life. Do you really? Understand what a Christ... Do we understand what a Christ-controlled life is? He says it. I do it. That's it. Okay? He says forgive. Guess what I do? Forgive. He says this. I do that. Why? Because he's the master. He's controlling me. Well, how does he get to control me? Because he bought me with a price, the Bible says, and I belong to him. I am his slave. I am his servant. I am his thulos, his bond servant. So that's, but understand here, in Mark, there are believers who don't want a Christ-controlled life. They want a me-controlled life. Everybody got that? Okay. And then Matthew is the message of the kingdom. Now, each of these will be brought out. All right? And what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a look at each of these. So that now that you see them down, right, I want to look at each of the parables and show you exactly where these differences are coming from. Because I'm not just pulling these out of the sky, right? Okay, here we go. So difference number two, let's look at the different types of seed. Now remember, whatever the Holy Spirit has written down, we have to pay attention. Turn to Luke chapter 8. Can you show or see? No. Luke chapter 8, verse 11. And if you're the type of person that highlights or writes in their Bible, 
I would encourage you to circle these three things because they make a huge difference about what we're looking at. Okay? So, in the parable of the sower in Luke, we're talking about salvation, right? Now, let's see what it says. Look at verse 11. This is the parable of the sower. Now the parable is, is this. The seed is the what? Okay, now it is the word of God. Now, you're going to write that down, but I want you to take a mental picture of that. Because the word of God is going to focus on how a person gets saved. Okay? So the word of God is how a person gets saved. And who is the word of God? Jesus. Okay? And it is only through Christ that we are saved. Okay? Everybody see that? All right. So now, let's look at Mark. Turn to Mark chapter 4. And verse 14. All right. So in Luke, we see salvation of the spirit. Okay. In Mark, we're looking at salvation of the soul or the Christ-controlled life. Okay. Look at verse 14. Everybody ready? The sower sows what? Oh, lighthouse rules? Lighthouse rules are effective. Don't you apologize? 414. All right, so now you saw in Luke, what does it say? The sower sows the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Watch this, verse 14. The sower sows what? The word. How come it doesn't say of God there? Because Mark is giving you a completely different picture. He's not talking about the Word of God. He's just talking about the Word. How is your life supposed to be run? By the Word. As a believer, I'm supposed to follow the Word. If the Word of God is eternal salvation, then I would think that the Word for the salvation of the soul is going to be a little bit different as far as being written down in the Word of God. And lo and behold, it is. So in Mark, you see that it is the Word. It's not the Word of God. Okay? Everybody see that? Important. Now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. So, and I'm, these, these are up here for you so that you can see. And I'm going to tell you something. When I was studying this, you know, back when this was originally presented to me and I was going through and studying this, and I saw these three, it really made my eyes go, oh, that is kind of weird. I mean, why is it different? And remember, everything the Holy Spirit has written down is important. Now listen to me. Flip that around, too. Some things, like we learned last week, that the Holy Spirit does not say are important. Remember eternal life and life? Okay? All right. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 19. When anyone hears, what? The word of the kingdom. Now that's completely different. It's not the word of God. It's not the word, and it's not the word of the kingdom. Now this is what they'll tell you. Oh, it has the same word, word, in it. So they all mean the same. No, nope. they truly don't. And now look, what happens if I look at all three parables, and I just say they're all the same? You get very confused. You get extremely confused, right? Because when you're going to think, wow, I guess you can really lose your salvation. See the problems? Because, if listen, if you don't understand the salvation of the soul, the whole Bible will become confusing to you. Yes? And this is, you know, Scripture, interpret Scripture. God is not the author of Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in Matthew. Let's camp out here. Because this is the one that we want to focus on. Because this is the this is the meat of the word, which is entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So, Matthew chapter 13, go back to verse 9. I'm going to read verse 9, or verse 3 through verse 9. That's when Jesus gives it. And then I'm going to give you the interpretation. And then we're going to tear this apart. Okay? Everybody with me? Verse 3, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. And others fell upon the rocky places, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, 
because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they what? Withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop. Watch this. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, anytime you hear, he, he who has ears, let him hear, talk about your spiritual ears. It's not these things here, it's your spiritual ears. Same thing with eyes. When Jesus is opening the eyes of the blind, it's a picture for us that he's talking about believers. We have to have spiritual eyes. All right, now jump down to verse 18. And now watch what he does to describe and explain the parable. Verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. There's a clue there. Verse 22. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed does what? Bears fruit, see it? And brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Okay? Now, this is what I want you to see. In this parable, we are not talking about believers at all. Okay? So, we're looking at four different types of Christians. Okay? So in this passage, we see four different types of Christians. There is no unbeliever here whatsoever. Okay? No Did I say believer? There is no unbeliever here at all. Okay? Now, this is how we know that. It's the word of the kingdom. In John, Jesus says no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless he is first born again. No one then can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's born of spirit and water. So understand, we're not talking about salvation of the spirit. We're not talking about salvation of the soul. We are talking about gaining entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So can an unbeliever gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven? No, they have to be saved first. Okay? Got that? All right, so let's look at the first one. Oh, the sower of the seed, obviously, is Jesus. This is the parable. The sower of the seed is Jesus. And you can probably tell from verse 19, the seed that is being sown. Now, I put this up here this way so that you would understand it. It's the truth of the kingdom. Because there are a lot of lies about the kingdom. There are a lot of people who say that heaven and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing. All you got to do is trust Jesus and you get everything. It's called upward sports and I can't see it. Okay. The, the whole participation thing is a problem. It's a huge problem in the body of Christ. Yeah, yes, not everybody wins. Bible's clear on that. Alright, so the first seed that is sown beside the road, we are going to call this a wayside Christian. Okay? A wayside Christian. Uh, verse 4 and verse 19. Verse 4. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Okay, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, now watch, and does not understand it. Now watch this. These are believers who are not in the way or the path where Jesus walks. Under, look where they're at. These seeds are sown, but they're outside of the path. Now, if they fall on a believer, this believer is outside the path. 
Turn to Luke chapter 13 for a second. Luke 13, verse 24. We looked at this a little bit last week, and that's why we really didn't get into it last week, because we have to look at it here. Now, there will be some who will tell you that this narrow door is the door to get you into heaven. Okay? And we're going to seriously put that to bed tonight. Okay? And you can tell that by the very first word that's used. Verse 24 says this. Strive. Okay? Strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now watch. You ready for this? This can't be an unbeliever. Becoming saved. Why? Because Jesus is telling them to strive. We also know that Jesus is talking to believers. Okay? But now look. If he was talking to unbelievers, he tells them strive to enter the narrow door. Well, that word strive is where we get the word agonize. So if that sound like a word to anybody? Agonizum. Absolutely. All right, so now what are we seeing? He's saying you have to do something to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will what? Seek. Listen to me. Unsaved people don't seek. Only a believer seeks. Just like unsaved people don't repent. Only a believer repents. Okay? Alright? They will seek and will not be able. The, the, the unsaved don't seek. So Jesus is clearly telling us, he's telling believers, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you have to agonize, you have to strive. What's that all about? We'll cover that a little bit later. Matthew chapter 7. Come on back for a second. We looked at this one in detail last week. Now watch what he says here. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to what? Okay, he does not say everlasting life there. He just says life. Why? Well, remember we covered that last week. Because he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And few are those who find it. Look, I'd say a person can't seek. If they're not seeking, can they find anything? No. Makes sense, right? All right, so what you're seeing here is only believers are seeking. Only believers are entering. Everybody see that? Okay, so now this wayside Christian ain't in the way. He's not in the way of Christ. He's doing his own thing. Now watch this. These are believers that are saved, but that's all. Okay? This believer accepts the lie that there is no other biblical truth that they need to learn. They believe that they are saved, they cannot lose their salvation, but then they further believe that all believers are equal and everybody going to get the same prize when they get to heaven. Now, there is a distinction about this believer. It's very, very important, and it's this next slide. The wayside Christian is unteachable. Okay? They're unteachable because they're prideful and they're arrogant. We have to be. God tells us time and time again, I give grace to the humble. I'm opposed to the proud. So when he wants to show you something in God's word and you say, oh, but I've always heard it that way. I've always been taught that. You need to be willing to check it out with the word of God to see if it's right or not. Okay? Yes. Don't confuse me with the facts. I'm 
Lance used to say all the time. It's okay. Yeah. All right. So therefore, the agents of the enemy, which we saw in verse 9, come and snatch it away. All right? Now, I need you to... Let me make a distinction here. All right, we're talking about the word of the kingdom, meaning the, the truth of the kingdom, what we classify as the kingdom truths. Now listen to me. There are those believers out there that don't even get the, tr the truth of the kingdom sown to them. All right? This is only a talking about those that it's sown to. In other words, let me just put it to you this way. All of y'all in this room right here, everybody watching on video, y'all are getting the seeds sown on you. It's for you to examine where you're at. That's not my job. I know where I'm trying to be at. Anybody like this? Alright, so let's move on to the next one. The stony ground Christian. Now watch the distinction here. Notice that this believer receives the word of God with joy. Look at verse 20 of Matthew chapter 13. And the one on whose seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Woo! You're trying to tell me that there's rewards if we're faithful? That's awesome! That's cool! But, watch what happens in verse 21. Yet, he has no firm root in himself, but it is only temporary. Now watch what happens when affliction or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Right, I'll give you a description of this in just a minute. This represents a believer, but because of the shallowness in their life, the seed cannot take root. As a result, their sudden growth in the truth of the kingdom withers away, and no fruit is brought forth. Okay? This represents believers who are at first excited because of the truth of the kingdom. Wow, this is really great. So you're trying to tell me that all of these things that I've been teaching have been wrong. Wow, that's, wow, that's amazing. But there's a part to this. Because listen, understanding the truth of the kingdom is completely different than living by it. Same thing with salvation of the spirit. Same thing with a Christ-controlled life. Okay? Right. Yes. And I think too, sometimes people hear the truth of the kingdom and they get excited about it, and you know that that root starts. But then the first time somebody comes up against them and says, "Well, that's hogwash. I don't believe that. I've been this, I've been going to church for you know ninety years, and I've always heard it this yeah. way. Surely you are wrong." And they don't check it. They, they just backtrack. Oh, yeah. well, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I heard it wrong, you know. You ever seen that, that Christian where you have a conversation with them and they're like, they give you something and, and then something is given to them to refute what they say and they immediately start backtracking? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, well, I never went to seminary, so I don't know. You have everything that you need right here. Amen. Okay? Everything that you need is right here. <coughs> right? Amen. Huh? Exactly. And I, honestly, when you start sharing some of this with other believers that don't get it, mm -hmm. that you know, they look at you like you're crazy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Where did you yeah. get that? Try walking up to somebody, and we'll study this later, okay? Because this is the truth of God's word. You guys are getting an advanced part right here. Try walking up to somebody and telling them that the outer darkness is not Hades. That the outer darkness is only for a believer. Right, so we're trying to talk to somebody and tell them that we may not know exactly when Jesus is coming back, but he gives us an indication by things in there, and then they tell you that you're absolutely wrong. That I don't know. Because nobody knows the day of the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And don't want to try to even listen at all. Yeah. Try telling a pastor oh. the truth of the kingdom. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, my peers are the hardest. Yes, they, they, they My peers are the hardest to get across. You want to know they why? Smile at you. No, so let me, let me tell you the story of um, Pastor Whipple, who taught my mentor, and then I 
was shown these truths through the word of God through him. But Pastor Whipple was actually able to have a conversation with a very well-respected and very well-known pastor. Okay, this pastor pastors a church with about three to 4,000 people in his congregation. They went to a con conference. Pastor Whipple had a conversation with this, with this pastor. And the pastor saw the truth of the kingdom. They had a great lengthy conversation about it. But then at the end of their time together, he said, well, I can't go back and teach this to my people. Why? Say it again. Because they, they'd leave. Yeah, I can't go back and teach accountability because they'd leave. And, and he did just that. Yeah, and, and he did just that. He went back, and he's a very well-respected pastor to this day. Now, here's the thing. He was shown the truth of the kingdom, and he will be held responsible. Because what God was trying to do was all those thousands of people, can you imagine if they got on fire for the truth of the kingdom? I mean, look out now. All right, so here we go. The Stony Ground Christian is unwilling to pay the price necessary, now watch, to inherit the kingdom. Remember, who inherits? Only a child. Remember your lesson of inheritance and, and adoption. Okay? If you have to go back to that one, go back to that one. All right? So there is a price to pay as a believer in Christ. What is that price? Turn to Romans chapter 8 for a second. I think we've looked at this before, but I want to go ahead and read the Lord wants to go ahead and reiterate this. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And we actually looked at, say that again? We're going to the message now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now look, understand what, and we've looked at this passage before, and it's important because what it's saying here is these people are unwilling to pay the price necessary. What is the price? Here we go, verse 17 of Romans chapter 8. Lighthouse rules. Lighthouse rules are open. <clears throat> Somebody told me online, they're like, hey, that lighthouse rules thing, that's really cool. I wish my church did that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody ready? All right. If children, technon, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That's where everybody wants to stop. What's the next word? If, if yeah. indeed, we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. All right? This suffering is labeled in, in our passage as affliction or persecution. Now watch this. Sometimes we as believers suffer because of things when it comes to the truth of God's word. Either, these are such things as the loss of jobs, the loss of friends, or the shunning from peers because of the truth of the kingdom. Just like Brother Craig was saying, they'll look at you like, you're crazy. There's something seriously wrong with you. you I can't tell you how many times that Darlene and I have been, been told, or somebody else has told that, that we're all in a cult. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is a cult. It's the cult of the word of God, I guess. So we'll just go that way. All right. When the affliction and or the persecution is too much for them to take, like Darlene was saying, they immediately walking away. But what they're really doing is they're showing their allegiance to their own lives. They're not stepping out in faith and trusting what God says. All right. So to overcome the shallowness of life, we need to do what James says. Consider every single hardship that comes into your life as a good thing. That's right. Now listen to me. Any, any hardship that comes into your life, we think, oh no, the devil's attacking me. Hey, he got to get permission first. Right. He can't just say, God, you didn't even see it. Seriously? Yeah. If God wants to stop it, can he stop it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. He has to ask permission. God allows those things. Now look, if I have a, a trial or, a, or, or something in my life that's a hardship for me, I have to understand that God has allowed it. And if God has allowed it, he didn't allow it so that I would fall on my face and fail. He wants me to trust him with it. Okay? Preaching the choir right now. Okay, let's move on to the thorny ground Christian. Now, 
Look at verse 22 of Matthew 13. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Pastor. Yes. Can you tell us where we are again? Oh, Matthew 13. Can you read it again once I figure out where we are? Sure. Matthew 13, 22. Thank you. Somebody watching on videos going, thank you for asking that Somebody question. Is That's right. All right, Matthew 13, 22. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now, notice, this believer does not receive the word, nor is there any joy over it. All they do is hear it. Okay, that's key. The thorns represent the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. This represents a believer who is interested only in the lusts of the world and what the world has to offer. Okay? This also represents a believer who is more concerned with dinero of this word of this world and not storing up treasures in heaven remember what jesus tells us in matthew 6 store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust we ain't even gonna come close to it okay we can accumulate all the riches in the world that we want here but when you die the hearse ain't going with you you can't put it in a u-haul and it ain't gonna fall in you can put all the money you want to in that coffin but it ain't gonna be with you okay now this one here is probably the one that I've seen the most out of believers that are shown the truth of the kingdom. Because of the fact that the lusts of the world and the lusts of riches are so prevalent, okay? All you got to do is turn on the television. Darlene and I were watching a show the other night, IMB TV, and they have commercial, I mean, it's free TV, but there, there's commercials, right? Can't even watch the commercials, y'all. I mean, literally, we sit there like this. Yeah. Okay? Because look, and if you'll notice, I don't want you to, but you probably <laughs> already noticed it, right? But it's everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. Okay? Lust is everywhere. And people say, oh, well, lust is just a man thing. It ain't. Okay? Uh, they, no. hey, purses that are how much? Six to seven hundred dollars? I have to have this purse. No, you don't. Get yourself a Walmart bag and walk out the door. Okay? <laughs> 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 you can't drive that purpose. <laughs> that's, true. that's true. That's true. All right, so here we go. This is a believer who is, now watch this, totally involved in this world. Okay? And what they can gain in this lifetime. They don't have the vision to actually see past what happens when, when they take their last breath. It's, it's cool to think about that, yeah, I'm going to be in heaven one day, but they're doing everything they can to make themselves the best person they can here. Okay? Now, that is completely contrary to everything that Jesus did. When Jesus came, all he did was emptied himself, poured himself out, and gave. Gave, 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 gave. gave. And you would think Jesus would run out of steam, right? Nope. It's kind of like that psalm where it says, my cup overflows. See, the whole point of what God tells you in your life is to give. When it comes to your money, give, because it's not your money anyway, right? When it comes to time, give. When it comes to the gifts that God has given you, give. When it comes to the encouraging word, give it. Don't hold it. When it comes to forgiveness, give it. Don't hold on to bitterness. At all. Give, 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 give. And what does God do in return to you? He just keeps filling you and keeps filling you and keeps filling you. Okay? Now, their life is full of thorns, this believer, which is the cares of the world. And they cannot or they refuse to receive any of the truths of the kingdom, thereby becoming unfruitful. 
Here's something really interesting when I was studying about thorns. They grow on branches on vines. John 15, anyone? You know what happens? It's a part where the, a, new, a new part would come out to bear fruit, but there's a callus that goes over the top of it, and it turns into a thorn. And what does the thorn become? Painful. Who wore the crown of thorns? Dig into that one. There's a deeper picture than just Jesus putting a crown of thorns on his head. And it literally connects to this passage. Okay? All right, so now, enough with these people. Let's look at the good ground Christian. All right, here we go. This is the one that all of us are striving to be. I pray. This believer is one who receives the word of the kingdom and then brings forth fruit. Okay? We're going somewhere. Um, hold on a minute. Turn to Matthew. Oh, <laughs> Oh, here it is. The Holy Spirit's talking. Turn to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Okay. Now, so we're talking about fruit bearing, right? Do I have to bear fruit in order to get into, to gain eternal life? No. No. Thank you. Okay. So glad you said it. All right. Look at verse number 40, 42 of Matthew chapter 21. Uh, 42 is where we're going to start. We're totally off script, so if you guys need to write this one. Lighthouse rules. Lighthouse rules are in effect. Matthew 21, verse 42 is where we're going to start. Now understand, when Jesus came, he was preaching to Israel and Israel only. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 15, Jesus says, I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He only came for Israel. For what purpose? Because there was a promise made to Abraham a long time ago. Your descendants will have the land, and they will have a spiritual portion as well. The only problem was the land was a guarantee. It would never be taken away from them. But the spiritual portion, which is ruling and reigning with Christ, was conditioned. It was a conditionary thing. It was conditional. Thank you. All right? So now watch. So now, after Jesus has gone through, okay, because we're at the end of Matthew. Did you just stick here? Okay. So, that was, that was awkward. All right, so now, at the end of Matthew, Jesus has gone and he's taken his whole three years, three and a half years, and all he's done has been talking to Israel about repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is it. This is it. This is it. But Jesus knows they're going to reject him. So now, watch what he says. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. That's Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the rock. And upon that rock he will build his church. Guess what? Church in the building. The same. Okay? This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I mean, we can't understand this. That's exactly what happened to Israel, because Jesus was a stumbling block. Most of them didn't even want to believe he was the Christ. Now watch what he says in verse 43. This is so important. Ready? Therefore I say to you, leaders of Israel, the kingdom of God. Now this is one of the only times that Jesus is allowed, that Mark or Matthew is allowed to say the kingdom of God. Because Jesus is saying it. So when he's talking about the kingdom of God, which one is he talking about? Kingdom of God the Son. Right? Because remember, everybody's in the kingdom of God the Father. Right? Believers are in the kingdom of God the Holy Spirit. Now he's talking about his kingdom. So the kingdom of God, that spiritual portion you were supposed to, supposed to have, watch this, will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. Now here's the thing. Some people will tell you, oh, this is just Jesus telling Israel that they're no longer saved. Or he's telling a believer that or a believer that they thought they were saved, it's going to be taken away from you. Well, if that's true, then the only way that we can gain entrance into heaven is to produce. There, there's also a false teaching that Jesus took the spiritual blessing away from Israel, and they're no longer God's people. The church is now God's. That is 
is so false. Because there is no more Jew or Gentile. There is the body of Christ. Okay? But Israel still, yes. Verse 44. All right? And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. So what we're seeing is Jesus is presenting a truth. And what he's saying here is you fall on this stone, you're literally tripping over it. You're stumbling over it. It's become a stumbling block to the Israelites. That's exactly what happened. So what Jesus is literally saying in verse 43, the connection being bearing spiritual fruit. Now look, he's going to give the kingdom of heaven his millennial reign. He's going to give that kingdom to people who produce fruit. Now remember what we've talked about. We've looked at three folks so far, no fruit whatsoever. Only one out of the four, only one out of the four is bearing fruit. That should tell you something. Not a lot of people are going to be bearing fruit. Because it costs you something to bear fruit. Okay? Alright, so, here we go. Let's look at what it is to be a good ground Christian. Okay, there's a few things that we put together. Alright? They have no fear of tribulation or persecution. I can walk up to somebody, and I've done it before. I've talked to pastors, and I've talked about the kingdom of heaven. And what, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. When I do talk to pastors, the Holy Spirit just is like, over and he just speaks. And when I'm done, I'm like, whoa, that was awesome. And what do I get from the other pastors? Well, I'm not a dispensationalist, and I believe that the kingdom of God is not real. Bible are you real? I've actually heard a, I've actually heard a preacher tell me that. The kingdom of God is not real. It's, it's all figurative. It's, a, it's all figurative. Okay? Now look, what they do is they literally take the word of God and twist it to make it what they want it to say. See the problem? Okay? All right, next one. They know the hope of the testimony of the coming kingdom of Christ. What is the hope? What is hope? Is hope a guarantee? No, it's not. Okay, so now look. Some people, they've got that shirt that says, No Jesus, No Hope. It's true. So, those shirts, what they're trying to say is if you don't have Jesus, you have no hope of getting into heaven. True. But if I'm a believer, I'm not hoping to get into heaven. It's guaranteed for me. So what am I why does the Bible keep telling me to hope? Have hope. Because there's more than just Because there's more than just the thank you. <laughs> there's more than just eternal salvation. There is something more. That's exactly why you're here. Understand the Holy Spirit is prompted with inside of each and every one of you that, hey, there is more to the Word of God. That's why it's from milk moving to meat. Because we're getting off the bottle and we're going to the table to get the steak. Medium for me, please. Thank you. Craig likes his rare. Medium rare. Medium rare. Okay. You, you want, don't like the blood coming out? You're well done? <gasps> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I bet you can. I bet you can. Okay. And actually, I remember that next time. All right, so here we go. The next one. They are wise concerning the riches of the world. I want to turn to 1 Timothy 6 for this one. Because this is one of the things that, and if you'll notice, each of these literally connects back with the different types of soils. So 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse 9. I didn't even start reading it. He's like, oh, Lord. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Yes, before Revelation. If you get to the index, you've gone too far. Come back. <laughs> uh, Y'all, I am so glad to be doing this with you, really. I'm telling you. Y'all ready? No? No. I don't know the rest of that. Oh, it's so 
First Timothy 6, verse 9. And what you're going to notice about the riches of the world is that's exactly what that's exactly what the world wants you to have. You're nobody unless you're somebody. You're nobody unless you have the money like Bill Gates does or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be like Bill Gates. I want to be like Jesus. All right, here we go. Verse 9. But those who want to get rich, watch this, they fall into temptation and a snare. Sound like the horse? It does. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Now, look, look, listen now. He's talking about more than just the mumma. Okay? Can you just hold on? You're not stopping, are you? No, I'm not. He told me I have to read the okay. <laughs> For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Now, love what did it say? It does not say money is the root of all evil. This, this is what you need to understand. Money is a tool for you to use for God's glory. Amen. The only reason that you have money is because God's given it to you no matter how little or how much. It is a tool for you to use for God's glory. If we are using our money in a way that does not glorify God, guess what? You better change that. You better repent of it right away. All right? It's important. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and piercing themselves with many a pain. Now listen to me. Wandering away from the faith is not losing your salvation. Everybody understand that? Because you can't lose your salvation. It's impossible. However, if I chase after money so much, can I become the type of person that's so worried about himself that I don't care about Jesus anymore? Absolutely. So you have to be careful. We have to. Huh? Or care about others. There you go. There you go. Alright. Next one. Here we go. They know that the love of Christ is that hope, the anticipation of the coming kingdom. And it is the root where all spiritual fruit begins. They know that the love of Christ and the hope of the coming kingdom is the root where all spiritual fruit begins. If you live your life understanding the accountability that you have as a believer, once you stand before God at the Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, if you live your life that way, don't you think it'll be a little different than most believers? Absolutely. If my focus is on pleasing God, what am I going to do? I'm going to agonize in my life to please God. There's only one way that we can please God. Anybody know what that is? To love Him. How do you love Him? By faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If I love God, I trust God. If I trust God, I'll live by faith. What does Jesus say? If you love me, my commandments. My commandments. That's exactly right. All right. So, which kind of leads right into this next one. Okay. A good ground, good ground Christian lives by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Walk by faith, not by sight. Now, I'm going to throw myself right on the pile. This is hard for me. It's really hard for me to walk by faith. Because the enemy is allowed to show me all the bad things and all the hard things and all the difficult things that are coming in. And it really can become overwhelming. And it almost presses me down. And it's hard to just say, okay, God, I trust your word. Okay? I'm just, I'm being honest with you. That's how I am. Okay? What? What? You better say it if the Holy Spirit is willing to say it. You said the enemy is allowed to tell you those things. He's only allowed to tell you those things if you listen to him. He has no authority. from. <laughs> Let's see. 
Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by hearing. All right. So, when we look at the parable of the sower in Matthew, okay, understand the parable of the sower in Matthew is talking about the kingdom of heaven. The parable of the sower in Luke is talking about salvation of the spirit, how a person gets saved. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is to look at the parable in Luke, look at the parable in Mark, which is, talks about the salvation of the soul, look at the differences that are in there. A lot of them will be similar, but there are marked differences in each of those three parables. All right, any questions?
your word here about the parables that show us the different parts of our salvation. The salvation of the spirit, the salvation of the soul, and the word of the king. Lord God, I ask that you would lead us and that you would guide us. Continue to teach us. Continue to help us to have open hearts and minds. Lord God, you have shown us the perils of this world and how they can draw us down and draw us away from the truth of the kingdom. But still, God, you've presented it to us. And now it's up to us what we do with it. And Lord, I pray that each and every person that's here and each and every person that hears this or sees this, that they would be good ground Christians to produce a hundred 60. And I thank you, Father. It's in Jesus Christ's glorious name that I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen.